okay, I get it. I get it. I surrender. <laughs> I'm not going to make any more videos about dependent arising. Why? Because the stats are going... <whistles> Looks like you've heard enough about it for now. And if you haven't, you can go back into our early videos, especially the ones on Nibbana, the Nibbana series, and the existential, what is it? Existential something or other. <laughs> existential anomaly or whatever it is. That explains a lot about it. In fact, even back in the the Foundation series, there's a video on becoming. And of course, becoming, the process of becoming, is another word for paticca samupada, dependent arising, dependent origination, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so, okay. You see, my ultimate aim in all of this is to reunify Buddha's teaching and the Vedic tradition. There's no reason why they should be separate. There's really, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of ugly, you know. Buddha was born in Vedic culture. And he was certainly trained in it from a very early age as the son of a king, as a prince. And not only that, when you read through the Buddha suttas, he often refers to questions, issues, and topics that come up in Advaita and Vedanta. So there's really a, a very deep link between the teachings of Buddha and the Upanishads, for example. I think Buddha's aim was to find a way to express these very high teachings in ordinary language, to democratize them, to distribute them among the ordinary people as much as possible. Because you can never tell. Just because someone isn't born in a, a Brahmin family, that doesn't mean that they don't, don't have the capacity or the interest or the determination to attain enlightenment. In fact, in many ways, birth in a Brahmin family is a disqualification because they already have, by heredity, so many advantages in Vedic society. But what really happened? Why is there this tremendous split between Buddhism, now, today, and Hinduism? <laughs> both of which I consider bogus. And the reason is that Hindu, the word Hindu is not a Vedic word. It's not a Sanskrit word. It comes from Urdu. And that is a language that was spoken by some of the Muslim invaders of India. So there's a very good historical case for the origin of the word Hindu as a Muslim pejorative against the Vedic people. And the same with Buddhism. Huh? Anything that's an ism is a concocted thing. It's a, a fabricated thing. It may be based on something real, but it itself is more or less an intellectual fabrication. So Hinduism and Buddhism are both concocted, phony things, sectarian religions built on top of authentic accounts of first-person self-realization. And in the Vedic tradition, those are the Upanishads. And in the Buddhist tradition, those are the Buddha suttas. Now in the it's a big problem because in the Buddha tradition, there are a lot of writings attributed to the Buddha, but not written by him, written long after he passed away. 
And you can tell the difference because the style, the overall tone and texture of these writings is mark markedly different. You see in these later writings, the Buddha is elevated from a human being to some kind of godlike state. Huh? And the descriptions of the crowds around him and the different devas and stuff like this are, are, are completely exaggerated to the point of being unbelievable. So this kind of hype, you know, <laughs> it's like marketing hype. This is the best product. This is the best religion. Buddha was this powerful being like a force of nature and so on like that. No, he was a man. He was a man who attained the highest enlightenment. And yes, that does mean he's non-different from God. But that does not mean that we should make him into God. You see, because the body, the shell, the mind, the personality, the human part is still human and has all the fallibility of human life. Buddha still got sick from time to time. Now, if he was God or some super powerful being, why would he get sick? And it's described that after 80 years of age, he lost the will to live. The body had become very oppressive to him. He told this to Ananda. And this is duly recorded in the suttas, but you'll never hear it talked about at your local temple. See? I think that the Vedic tradition, in fact, I was just talking with a friend of mine this morning about this. The Vedic tradition is much more accepting the individual qualities and quirks of its enlightened people. The, the Vedic system has much more freedom. So in, in other words, if I was to go to Sri Lanka and start preaching hardcore Advaita Vedanta, I would be in trouble. I would be harassed. I would have a problem, a social problem. But if I come to Tiruvannamalai and start preaching hardcore Buddhism, eh, nobody cares. <laughs> See, that's the difference between the two cultures. Now, as far as the religions are concerned, there was a, a tremendous split because of the degeneration of Buddha's teaching after he passed away. Some of the sects, sects, sects <laughs> that evolved were completely at odds with the original teaching. And they were often very degenerate morally degenerate and spiritually degenerate, like black magic cults. In fact, Buddhism in Africa degenerated into what we now call voodoo. Voodoo comes from Budu, which is one of the names of Buddha in African language, or even actually in Sinhala. In Sinhala, people greet each other with Budu Saranai, May Buddha bless you. But the whole cult, the whole religious, orthodox cult of Buddha as God, this is completely, really against Buddha's teaching. Buddha did not believe in idol worship. He did not believe in the worship of gods. So now, to have Buddha worshipped as a god is completely contradictory. Why did this come up? Well, it came up because in India there was a tremendous uh, response against the phony Buddhist cults. And as usual, it went too far and it became a slaughter. It became like uh, Armageddon where people were just going and any Buddhists they saw, they simply killed. It was like a Holocaust. 
and the Buddhists fled. They fled north to Tibet. They fled east to Burma and Sri Lanka and even China. So, of course, the knowledge that they took with them may have been more or less bona fide, authentic, depending on how close they were to the original teaching, the Buddha. But the cutting off of Buddha's teaching from the Vedic tradition had one tremendous weakness. It no longer had a dualistic huh, Dvaita Vada and a, a Vishishta Dvaita Vada devotional stage to prepare people, to qualify people for its meditational stage, its meditational content. Buddha's teaching is all about meditation. The Eightfold Noble Path is completely about preparing you for meditation. But until someone has the qualifications, especially the karmic qualification for embarking on this path of meditation, vivartavada, their meditation will fail. And we see it in, in Sri Lanka today. There are all these people going to the temples, worshiping Buddha like a god, doing puja with lamps and flowers and stuff even offering food to Buddha, just like a Vedic deity. So what they did was, because they were missing the Dvaita Vada and Vishishta Dvaita Vada levels, the Buddhists borrowed the Vedic style of worship and simply applied it to the Buddha. And the results have been tragic. Because Buddha does not accept this worship. It's not his style. He prohibited it when he was present. He would not accept anyone to worship him. Yeah, just give me a, a little food in the begging bowl. That's all I need. He would not let anybody worship him. He would not let even people take notes in his lectures. He was so much against idolatry and fundamentalism that he, he just stopped all of this stuff and he threw people out if they tried to, to do it. In fact, he got so disgusted with his sangha at, at two different times in his life, he took a long vacation of just solo wandering. So the Buddha, if he saw what's happening today in his name, would really freak out. And we don't accept that. We think that there should be a unification, a unification of the Buddha's teaching with its Vedic roots and acceptance of the Vedic uh, dualistic religion and bhakti devotional religion as preliminary steps to the meditational practices given in Buddha's original teaching. And we think that we should just forget about the later uh, writings, such as the commentaries, the Abhidhamma, the Vinaya, Jataka, and other writings which are clearly post-Buddhist, after the Buddha disappeared. In fact, even the suttas themselves, Nyanananda told me they're only 90% accurate. There's a lot of fudging going on. Uh, because why? The Buddhist religion became politicized about a thousand, fifteen hundred years ago. And monks were brought from India who were disciples of Shankaracharya to rewrite the commentaries. So all of the original commentaries were lost. They were burned, destroyed deliberately. We have no idea what the original commentaries were like. So Nyanananda planted this seed in my mind that he told me anything in Buddha's suttas 
that doesn't agree with the Upanishads in essence is to be ignored. And we find that if we do an unbiased study, if we look into the Buddha suttas without all the encrustation of dogma that's happened in the last 1500 years, they are remarkably similar. In fact, identical. When I read Ramana Maharshi's teaching, and then I look at Buddha's original teaching, to me, they seem like the same thing. They're talking about the very same experience in different words, that's all. So going forward on this channel, you're gonna see a mix of Vedic teachings and Buddha's teaching. Because I think Buddha's teaching and the Vedic teaching shed light on each other. They help to clarify and give perspective on one another. And especially in the area of the higher levels of meditation, Buddha's teaching is far more detailed as you have seen in this series on dependent arising. See, it always irks me. I want to plan big, big series, huh? To cover a subject completely. But what happens is, after 10 or 12 episodes, everybody loses interest. Their attention span is, is really short and they need to see something new. Uh, well, my attention span is <laughs> very long. I would be happy to finish out, for example, Vedanta Sutra. I started a series on Vedanta Sutra, but after two or three videos, nobody was watching anymore. I have enough material just on name and form to do maybe a year's worth of video. <laughs> 15, 20 minutes every day for a year, just on name and form. So <laughs> after two or three videos of name and form, the stats are going down, down, down. <laughs> okay, you guys, I get it, you know. You want something new. I got something new. <laughs> so you're going to be seeing a new, <laughs> a new series here in the next few days. And uh, hopefully that will get somebody's attention. And uh, also I'm getting a surprise ready for the upcoming season in Tirvanamalai. So I hope your interest remains steady and your attention span <laughs> increases from your meditation practice. And sooner or later, I can get back and actually finish this series. Buddha Saranaya.